Um, yeah, so I actually forget the the long uh, title of the paper, but um, yeah, when we came to it, and I'll explain somewhat of how we came to title the project, we chose to name it for the Dharal word for paperback, which is Ya Angara. So there's a kind of a diphthong in there that I'm hoping people will get used to saying. Um, I'm speaking from Gadigal land and I want to acknowledge that. I just also want to acknowledge that I, like all of us live and work, or some of us live and I, I certainly work on the uh, uh, lands of the Dharawal, Wadi Wadi, Yuan and other indigenous peoples. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this is a collaborative project, which I will repeat, repeatedly turn back to throughout. Um, and also that, um, that it's a collaborative project and that I don't know, didn't know if I would have 15 minutes worth of things to say. More than that, I thought we would just sort of have an opportunity to sort of look at, and I, before, without further ado, I will put up so we can look at the kind of digital artifact that we've put together in this as part of this project. So I'll leave it on Alexis Wright, always a good thing to do. Um, and, maybe, and, um, and say that I'm really, really interested in feedback because this is a kind of an ongoing pilot, mock-up, collaborative attempt to create a kind of digital teaching tool around indigenous literatures in Australia. Um, and so I'm gonna narrate the process by which we came to uh, this project. I'm gonna talk a bit about the kind of epistemology of what we're trying to do with it and what we're not trying to do with it. Uh, and maybe the next steps of where we want to go next with it. Um, and I note that um, one of our wonderful collaborators, Chrissy Howe, is in the room and invite her at any point if she wants to say something to just jump in or raise hand or whatever is the etiquette of these spaces if I've forgotten something. So Yangara came about when a number of people within ASH, or I think then it was LHA, myself, Ika Willis, Chrissy Howe, um, and Luke Johnson, although Luke um, felt that he didn't have time to get engaged in this particular branch of the project, but we still worked with him on what I'm going to say next, which is Jindola, which a lot of people across the university are increasingly engaging with. Um, and Jindola is uh, obviously a way of engaging with Indigenous knowledge and decolonizing curriculum at UOW, um, led in, in no small part by Jade Kennedy, um, an education academic and Ewan man. Um, and in one of our sort of mid, middle to late meetings in that process, Jade suggested that what we might do is put together, because we were talking a lot, myself, Chrissy, Ika, in different ways about kind of that moment in teaching knowledge from a culture that you don't know, particularly an Indigenous culture, when you say, I don't know how to compare my usual kind of methodology or my usual kind of teaching practice to what is the kind of epistemological underpinnings of a, of a text from a radically other space. So we all know that, say for example, Alexis Wright, as this tool will tell us, works predominantly in the genre of the, or mode rather, perhaps would be better, of the novel. So if I go to a novel, I'll get Wright's The Swan Book, for example. If I go to Jack Davis, I'm more likely to be in the space of theater and the play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so they are working in Western modes, but they're also bringing to bear different kind of ways of knowing and being and seeing and doing um, on that space. And we wanted a way to sort of not, uh, Yangra as a teaching tool doesn't give you a way to think about that that is pre-made, but perhaps allows a medium through which to have conversations about which I'll say more earlier, uh, later, obviously. Um, so as a result of Jade's provocation that we might think about, I suppose, uh, a digital teaching resource, or as he put it at that stage, a database, um, we applied for a UOW-based grant through the Education Strategies Development Fund run through LTC. And we were successful in that small to medium sized grant and were able to then um, ask people who are perhaps better qualified than us what the best steps forward for such a project would be. 
And so in the first instance, we hired Evelyn Araluen and Kaur, who sometimes publishes and works under her, her first two names, Evelyn Araluen, who you, some of you may know subsequently uh, as the uh, co-editor of Overland, the literary journal. And she was then completing her PhD at Sydney University in um, spaces around Indigenous literary education and Indigenous literatures in Australia. And she came to us with, I might just um, unshare screen and actually go to another, go to the early designs from which we were working, because that's probably uh, informative. So just bear with me while I do that. And we asked Evelyn what she thought such a design for a database should look like. And this was one of her early kind of thoughts and so I really want to acknowledge Evelyn's intellectual property. She's still associated with the project as an editorial board member or an editorial advisory member. And she suggested that we work in relationship to circles rather than kind of um, other forms of, of spatial interface. Um, and although we've not gone necessarily in the direction of a timeline, her initial, uh, partly because to sort of save labor for one of our other researchers, uh, who nonetheless has done the data for a timeline um, of Aboriginal writing from 1796 to the present um, based on extant resources. Um, the idea was that you could uh, have a side interface, which we are working on in the current interface uh, with Medad uh, Amir Sigarami, if I'm not mispronouncing his name, um, and that there will be ways in which one can kind of work through uh, like through this space as kind of being continuous and, and, and regenerative rather than uh, linear and finite. Um, so just to go back to what we have eventuated with, I'll speak to that in a second. The, the researcher that I just alluded to, Luke Patterson, who is Camilla Roy, um, spent a lot of time going through um, my kind of thoughts and feelings and, and, and other things and sort of also some of the existing resources such as the um, Macquarie Pen Anthology for Aboriginal Literature and the Macquarie Pen Anthology for Australian Literature um, and edited by Anita Heiss and Peter Minter um, and other kinds of existing resources and laying out maybe what could potentially be covered on the long enough timeline in a resource like this. I um, said to him, that's great. And let's keep it to 12 authors. Because as it became clear, we had to make this happen within 18 months. It also became clear we needed to limit the scope of what we were trying to do. So we have actually a lot of uh, data that Luke has gathered and sort of amalgamated and organized. Um, and that I have subsequently amalgamated and organized in such a way as we could expand onward in this project, given world enough and time, given that ever important uh, aspect of funding. So that's how we came to where we are. I should also mention and acknowledge that we partnered with IT architects, Pascal Perez and Murdad Amiga Semi um, at UOW Smart Infrastructure Facility. And we have spent time consulting with uh, a number of, and we'll continue to spend time consulting with uh, Indigenous writers who are both featured in the current design and also who had uh, generative knowledge about the prospect of how we could go on with the design and how and what we should incorporate. Those include uh, uh, Bidura writer Yvette Holt, and in uh, September, Tony Birch will join us from Nam or Melbourne to, uh, and it will come in person to Wollongong to give a public lecture on the 1st of September and talk about this. Uh, let me just... Can you see the um, actual database that I, yeah, great, thanks. Jim. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit in a certain kind of way about what Yaangara is not. Um, and I think it might actually, in question time, come back to some of the things Sue was saying about publication and planetarity and the kind of Barzian, Christavan kind of notions about 
the limitations of knowledge in publication and why one might actually take seriously the limitations of knowledge in publication and and, and deliberately limit oneself in order to not produce uh, not to put too fine a point on it a kind of an overly commodified product made up of other people's cultural knowledge right it can't too readily be kind of used to package knowledge and take it away easily and mine that kind of data um so typically the role of the digital in the digital humanities for instance in the database or the web resource is to make available to the user uh and and, and, I, and i'm hoping ted will pick me up on where i've gone wrong on this but my understanding is that often you want to kind of make available to the user new or if not new previously unseen information for sharing or for their edification um, in this metaphor data is mined or otherwise extracted given how problematic such narrative of, of extraction can be in the material and geographical world of the lived experience of indigenous peoples ya Angara from the outset refuses this model of extraction while we do attempt to make information accessible for the use of indigenous literatures, we also employ an in interface that refuses a simple extraction model and prompts thinking about its framework for organization. Indeed, there are existing, and we do this not only, of course, because we have a philosophy of what we want it to look like, although that's the case, but also because um, there are existing exhaustive databases, for example, black words run out of Austlit at the University of Queensland, and we do not aim to either compete with such models or duplicate what they're doing. Rather, Yaangara offers an interactive teaching tool for challenging exhaustive preconceptions about Indigenous literatures in Australia and providing an implicit epistemology for users. That epistemology has a sense of kind of continuity and atemporality that is generated from the kind of circular design. Um, it's also an, the idea, and we, we haven't yet created this, but the idea is we would create a kind of a how to use Yaangara resource, and that how to use Yaangara resource works in such a way that one of the things we want people to do is use this as a teacher and a student, or as two students together under the guidance of a teacher, such that um, the aim is to both facilitate and also tactically disrupt the ability of users to simply enter, acquire data and exit. Um, instead, we want users to have their expectations about Aboriginal writing disruptive and reconfigured. So we might, I mean, although this is not an exhaustive model, they might be interested to know the number of kind of uh, works in, you know, the kind of the, 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 the intervention of Aboriginal writers in the verse novel, the relative paucity of traditional or dream time stories in this uh, sample set as compared to the novel. To show the kind of continuity and uh, of practice with uh, Western practices, for want of a better term, that people might, uh, Aboriginal writers might be in, 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 at the top of their game, might be um, intervening in. So I'll just also suggest that we might um, show uh, an example of what is currently like an author page, but that we hope to expand. So this is an author page on Kim Scott. If you can click on the Kim Scott circle, you get a very short bio of Kim and, a, um, uh, and that's it at the moment. What we hope to do is update author pages with new, uh, you know, as culturally sensitive as possible author biographies with, and also with select bibliographic information. So that would be information, not only a list of a short, an annotated short, or not an annotated, but a short list of works by the author, but also works about the author that we think might be critical in teaching and thinking about those texts. So there is kind of some degree of a kind of informative dimension, if not an extractive dimension, and around the text. That is to say, what would it mean to think about Kim Scott in relationship to um, Derrida? Or what would it mean to think, uh, think about Kim Scott in relationship to other knowledge that's not directly related to, to Willem and Noongar knowledge? Or what would it mean to think about Kim Scott along with the Chadwick Allen, who is a, um, a Cherokee, no, no, sorry, a Chickasaw uh, author working at the University of Washington, to think about him in terms of his, uh, Scott in terms of Allen's notion of trans-Indigenous connections between Indigenous writers. You have Indigenous writers written uh, in, uh, 
the resources about Indigenous writers that bridge the gaps between Indigenous and Western knowledge, but also that bridge the gaps between um, Indigenous writers and other Indigenous writers in a kind of trans-Indigenous mode. Um, the other thing that we're working on actively um, in the, what time we have left before our November deadline to spend our funds comes is we would like to add a country circle, a circle that would uh, give a sense of uh, the kind of territorial identifications of writers included in the, in the uh, web resource. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to do that to uh, too readily without more consultation because many writers of course do not only have multiple identifications with different countries but also um, sometimes you know modulate or, 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 or shift identification as new knowledge becomes available to them about their own identity descent and belonging and recognition. Um, that's not true across the board but that is true in some instances. Um, and we also want to include interviews with uh, as many of the authors that are included here uh, as possible video interviews, as well as an acknowledgement of country front page that one needs to click through and watch a video about this country, or rather I should say I'm speaking from Gadigal country, so really the Illawarra, and, and, how, that, and, and, how, um, and how people are positioned in that place, speaking to male and female community members across generations at the advice of Jamie Beveridge from the uh, Wuyunga Indigenous Center. So I suppose I might, that's really all I have to say. I think I went for a little shy of 15 minutes, so more time for chats, but um, I will unshare my screen, but I can always reshare it if anyone wants me to uh, show any other aspect of that, but I'll yield the floor. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Okay. Uh, yeah, so Ted is now going to respond. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I will now share my screen. Uh, hopefully everyone can see what I'm sharing. Uh, I'm sharing the younger screen. Can, you, can everyone see that? Okay, so um, uh, this was really interesting uh, and, and thanks for Mike for, for inviting me to, to act as a respondent. Um, uh, I have a number of notes and the reason I'm sharing my screen is that I want to show you some, uh, some stuff. Uh, as, a, as a sort of thinking provocation that hopefully, hopefully can, can help you think uh, um, uh, differently or, or to, to give you some ideas maybe on, on uh, how to expand this, this uh, wonderful resource. So um, uh, the first thing that struck me when I looked uh, at uh, the younger resource, and I hope I pronounced it correctly, is uh, the the fact that this concentric circle layout is uh, emphasizing um, there's, there's a non-hierarchical frame of reference in effect here, right? So there's no hierarchy between uh, uh, the, the authors and uh, the types of stories and the stories themselves, right? So they're part of a, of a continuous chain. And I think this is a really important uh, uh, kind of conceptual organizational decision um, and, and uh, it registers immediately as a, uh, in terms of uh, formatting the, the choices you have as, as a reader, as someone who is encountering this resource for the first time. And uh, it also struck me that the, the authors seem to be linked in a yarning circle in the center and uh, kind of positioned on a flat ontological plane because you, you see how the novels and the essays and the plays and uh, the poetry are kind of operating on the same ontological plane, right? There is no differentiation between them, uh, um, even, even in terms of the architecture of the site. And I thought this is really important. Uh, and again, it registers immediately when, when you are 
uh, playing a little bit with uh, the resource. Um, I liked also that you have this, uh, this, uh, this, the stories exist as if in a bead. So, you know, you have uh, Hermann Hesse uh, uh, and, and uh, his, his metaphor of the bead in, in the context of Buddhism, but uh, uh, you have this, this circular thread of beads where everything is tied in a chain of shared coexistence as opposed to somehow individuated and uh, alienated. Right to be waiting to be consumed and encountered. Right, so it's everything is tied together and exists together. So you see the connections when you hover over the authors, uh, or the novels, uh, or any of the other of, of the stories. But uh, uh, when you look at it as a whole, everything appears as a as a, I mean, for lack of a better word, as a system. And I thought uh, uh, this is this is a really interesting form of organization. Um, it's also very important from my perspective, just because these uh, um, these these stories, these different uh, uh, pieces of knowledge, are created in different times, and yet they coexist here. And I thought this is a really interesting uh, and really important perspective because they are organized in a continuous cyclical time. Uh, and, and, and as such, they are dramatically opposed to this Western Judeo-Christian telegony of, of uh, uh, you know, targeted time. Uh, and I thought this is a really important perspective uh, to, to, to deploy. Um, and the key question that uh, I was left with after, uh, you know, and I was playing with this for a while, just thinking about, uh, and I kept returning to, to uh, um, younger, just to, to, to look at it visually and I even took a screenshot so I can look at it a few more times without logging in. Um, how, how to communicate a, radi a radically other knowledge and uh, a key qualifier on its own terms, right? Um, because as, as you very pointedly and, and correctly, I think pointed out that uh, uh, this, this uh, database form of organization uh, and the, the modes of data lend themselves to this narrative of extraction, this narrative of, uh, uh, of uh, ex exploitation almost of the knowledge on uh, someone else's terms. And there is, there is a kind of co consumption logic to, to this exchange. It's not a, a, a logic of uh, um, knowledge sharing and of, of uh, um, this kind of encountering the other, but it's a, a logic of consumption. So it's really interesting how, how you and, and the, the group that is involved here is trying to, 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 to resist that logic. Uh, like uh, this, this, the, the, the refusal to uh, submit to data extraction as a, as a mode of communicating a knowledge. I thought this is really powerful. Um, and as an alternative, just one suggestion is this notion, uh, and I, you, you can approach this metaphorically or, or, or literally if you, this notion of affinity, affinity with knowledge. Um, the, the, the notion of building connections and even to, I would, I would uh, argue that it's really uh, important that you, uh, uh, push this uh, visual allegory of the yarning circle, and I'm using allegory here because this term dropped a few times today, of the yarning circle as an as a architectural uh, uh, decision, right, as a form of organization, to push it even further as a kind of, as a refusal of the database model, which is always already hierarchical and structured and informed by this mode of uh, uh, extraction, right? So, the iron circle is, a, is, a, is the building of affinities, the building of connections, right? Which is a, a, a radically different mode of organization. So, um, uh, because I have only five minutes, uh, two, two kind of provocations, if you will. Uh, one is, I, I termed it for myself and I'm looking slightly here because I have my notes on the other screen. One is this, this notion of the land. And the land is so important and yet so hard to, uh, to, to, to uh, communicate. 
on its own terms, right? And so the, the question is how to communicate the, the materiality of the land in which this kind of yarding circle is, is possible, in which the building of these affinities becomes possible. Uh, and, and that materiality of the land has to be communicated somehow on its own terms, right? Not in terms of the, the modern frame or in terms of uh, uh, some sort of exploitative uh, uh, relationship. Um, and uh, uh, the second, the second uh, uh, kind of provocation, if you will, is, is the, the word. So, so how to tell the lineage of these stories? Because I think it's really important, like the, the, uh, the, the model of organization you've deployed suggests that these stories do not appear as some sort of individuated, uh, uh, um, you know, commodity to be consumed. They are parts of a or a multiplicity of lineages. And so these lineages are very important as well. So uh, how, how to communicate the lineages of these stories as part of the stories, as, as part of their affinity circle, if you will. And where is the author in this? And so what I wanted to show you is, uh, so hopefully this is going to be visible. Uh, can everyone see what I'm showing? I'm showing a, a, um, the Amazon. Uh, this is a website called Give me a moment. I'll, I'll drop this in the chat later. So uh, this is a website called uh, 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 Rainforest Archiver. So it's a Norwegian project. And uh, well, the reason I'm showing you this is because this is a, an effort to help people understand what, what it means to be uh, uh, living in the, the Amazon and uh, what it means to uh, engage uh, in the Amazon, uh, what it means to participate. And so, um, here you have, uh, I hope this is visible to everyone. So, um, you have uh, the, the denizens of Uh, this specific locale, um, uh, the, over 300 lever in Skogen, so they can be over 20 or gone. The animals, the people, so there's, there's a, you have an effort, and you know, this is, this will never be perfect, but you have an effort to, uh, communicate, uh, a space. Um, another one I wanted to show you is, uh, this. So uh, again, you have an effort to communicate a specific uh, uh, locale, uh, a specific place uh, with its sounds, with, uh, with uh, uh, all the different uh, um, you know, non-human and maybe humans uh, uh, populating it. And uh, just snapshots of their story. So again, this, this can be organized in, in different ways. And uh, just to not to make this too long, uh, the final thing I wanted to show you. Sorry, Ted, I might just stop you there if that's okay, because we are kind of like coming just, just to one 20 thing. past. Just, just um, one thing. Just, very, just one very thing. quickly, thanks. Very quickly. So this is a, a website, it's called Newest Americans. And so this is a website uh, 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 with stories from uh, uh, recent immigrants in the United States, from New Jersey to be specific. And uh, it's a really interesting, I'll send you the links. Uh, it's a really interesting way of organizing, um, uh, showing these, these people and their stories uh, and building, building this as a, um, as a repository, if you will, of, uh, of uh, who they are, of uh, their environment, how they're involved with it and, and their struggle. So, and again, the, the effort here is to, to build an affinity. Okay, and I will shut up. Thank you, Ted. Okay, so there's a lot for Mike to respond to there. Um, 
we have about 10 minutes left. We can go a little bit over, but I don't want to kind of like, you know, <laughs> kind of keep yeah, people yeah. here. I'm, keep I'm, people I'm sure people, so I'm Mike, if you can, if you can respond yeah. maybe in, in five or so five minutes, or less. we might we might have a bit of time for people to ask further questions. I'm fairly sure I can keep it under three, maybe five mm -hmm. minutes as a response. And, um, and 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 I know people have places to go and be. So um, first of all, thanks so much, Ted, for such a generous um, response and sort of like, and sort of getting what we're trying to do with the sense that you were able to see um, the non-hierarchical dimension of the circles and connect it to a yarning circle, which we hadn't explicitly done, but certainly there. Um, uh, and I like, that this idea of a coexistence beyond time is something that came out of what you 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 observed in sort of interacting with the space. Um, in terms of the other kinds of models, actually, when we did a con consultation last December, people did say, "What about a map?" And the only reason I did, I sort of, and I think all of us, I think Chrissy can remind me if I'm being selective in my memory, but that we decided to kind of, uh, we were kind of in some ways bound to a certain kind of ex exigency bound to the kind of the vision that, you know, the initial design that we'd taken up and adapted from what Evelyn had kind of brought to the table. And also because uh, there are maps in existence in kind of digital humanities in Australia and, 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 and so of, of various kinds around like the Bureau of Meteorology has one around like seasonal differences in various indigenous countries. And um, there's a massacre map uh, done by historians. Um, but I think I, I, I nonetheless take very seriously what you said about the necessity to deal with land and how to communicate the importance of land and of country. Um, and I want hopefully that to be something we do for a further ring. By the way, I should say, um, you might note just from a user, user interface perspective that more than sort of three rings might actually get a bit jumbled and difficult to see and work with. And what we are told by, what Mathad has told us, um, sort of the key IT architect working on the project, is that what would happen is you would substitute one for another. So you'd always be working with three rings. I can see Chris nodding, which I take to be a good sign. You, you can always have three rings, but then you can also draw, if you want to have country and genre, you can bring in country, genre, and author and put text aside or whatever it might be, so that you have as many, you have N minus one rings as a kind of possibility, circles is always a possibility, but you never have more to work with than I can't, than would overwhelm a user or an interface. It's supposed you know, as a kind of lay person, I understand that's the case. Um, and the last thing I want to suggest, I think affinity is absolutely a really useful like um, category to think through, think with as a kind of a way for users to engage or maybe non-indigenous users. And I certainly when I wrote I wrote a conversation article a couple of years ago um, and it was, it had a last line in it about how um, Aboriginal knowledge was, you know, understandable as a form of property. And I got really bagged, not by Aboriginal writers and critics, as far as I know, but largely by white romanticisms about what Aboriginal knowledge is. And it led me to kind of think, and I was kind of critiquing um, Kwame Anthony Appiah's notion that we need to get away from notions of property in, in terms of culture altogether. And I just think that, and I think you resonate with this, Ted. Um, I'm not, um, it's, uh, it's not a hostile response, but I just feel that we need to maintain, that our challenge is we need to aim, maintain the autonomy of people's knowledge that we are making available in a kind of node while not commodifying it in a certain kind of way. And so what I would say is that it is the intellectual property of our kind of um, authors making up the knowledge and their people, but it's not necessarily um, a commodity to be exchanged in the same way in all shapes and forms that it might take. Um, so that's that's where, where my thinking is around property and commodity and how you communicate this radically other knowledge on its own terms, which was your excellent Excellent question, but I'll shut up because maybe there's five minutes more for other people if they want to ask questions or comment or anything like that. 
Joshua. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, and yeah, thanks, Chrissy and, and Mike um, for that the project. It's really wonderful. Uh, uh, this, this is a question to both Mike and Chrissy because you've both been involved in this. Yeah. You mentioned that, I mean, Tony Birch is coming and you've actually worked with some other authors who are included in the database. I'm just wondering how they have, if, if you could share some individual responses that they've had, um, and in particular, how they might participate or how they might have thought about participating even in the developing of their own biography or their own kind of placement, how, how they have responded to this, this the database and the, and the project. Thanks. Chris, do you want to go? Yeah, sure. So the only person I've spoken directly with about it, other than um, Evelyn, who obviously, you know, came up with the concept for the whole database and Luke, who's been doing the research work, Luke Patterson, um, was Yvette Holt, who, um, came, who Mike organised to come to visit us last year. And we showed her the, um, what we had of the database so far. And she said, and then correct me, Mike, if you've got a different memory of this. She said that it looked great, but she said, you need more, um, you need more straight men represented. <laughs> Which I, was really I had forgotten that actually. <laughs> That's like the response that kind of stuck with me from um, her looking at the list of authors that we've chosen. So from, I think for me, one of the things that's always been a bit tricky with this is um, we, we do need to, to limit it in some way. And there are so many Aboriginal authors. And the ones we've chosen are um, people who are really well known and also people with links to this place and to you and you and country as well. So, but that's a that's a tricky thing because there are just so many writers. So trying to figure out which ones will represent um, in the database in its first iteration is it was a tricky thing. Um, and as Mike said, there's a whole lot more information about people that we can include later on. Um, but it just then becomes unwieldy at this point with how big it is at the moment to be able to manage all of that information. At once, so that's that's been a tricky thing for me to kind of think through. But yeah, Mike, did you want to add anything? Yeah, it's one of the hardest things. I mean, there's a uh, Luke is drafting some new, better author bio lines, and as part of his ambit, um, he he or I, depending on what's most appropriate, probably him is more appropriate. Um, but also, he's a you know a busy person with his own life. And its own employment elsewhere. Um, it depends who among us, but certainly some one of us will be trying to contact every author represented and verify, you know, if they have any, if we've made any, any kind of clear error in how we've described them or something like that. Things like that. So there's a few things yet to be done as well, um, and that's partly why we, you know, aren't showing this externally very much, if at all. You know, so we're hoping to launch by September. Uh, and that will be, there'll be, the, the, these, these are really important concerns. And the other thing, which I think is implicit in what Chrissy was saying is how many authors are not represented in this, just so we could make it functional. Yeah, Sue, Sue had a question, yeah. Yeah, I do. Just, just two very quick questions, Mike. Um, are you thinking or have you thought about screenwriters? I'm just wondering if, um, if this mm. limited to a certain kind of writing, because we've got, you know, quite a few screenwriters in the Illawarra um, and I'm trying to locate Indigenous screenwriters all the time. Um, and the second question is, when is Tony Birch coming? Has he has the, t the date moved? No, he's still coming. Um, the date? He's supposed to be arriving. I, I sent him a, an itinerary yesterday. I'll send it on to you uh, uh, after this, but it's um, still the 29th, uh, the, the, the first day of the, of the week that begins August the 30th, he should arrive and the um, and September the first was to be uh, when he uh, would give the public lecture, and this would launch. Right. Okay. All good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And as for screenwriters, I mean, I'm thinking like, I mean, not, not, I don't know this area as well as you would or others would. I'm thinking sort of like Rachel Perkins and people like that, right? Um, I wouldn't be epistemologically opposed to including writers working more broadly. It would just be a question of priority. Priority in the scheme of the fact that there are so many, for example, playwrights, we have one playwright included on the list, for example, so far. Um, so yes, but it'll be when we get there is the kind of short answer, I think. 
yeah. and this also depends like unfortunately comes down to there are some things that I'll, I and other team members will be able to work on after the November date when we run out of the, the opportunity to spend what funding we have and there are some things that will not be possible without funding like like bringing further riders and things like that so. okay yeah. thanks